the economy of Nazi Germany. What we're going to talk about here is the nature of the kind of economic system that the Nazis created once they came to power in Germany in 1933. We typically know quite a lot about other aspects of Nazi Germany, but it's only in recent years, I think, that there's been some serious attention paid to the kind of economy that they created and the economic philosophy that they had, because they did indeed have one. Now, the background, of course, is what happened in Germany between 1929 and 1933. Germany was very badly hit by the Great Depression. Uh, the German economy had one of the worst performances between 1929 and 1933, uh, about as bad as the United States, perhaps even a little bit worse, significantly worse than Great Britain uh, or a number of other European countries. In particular, there was very high unemployment. Uh, many of the major firms in Germany became insolvent and were in danger of simply shutting down completely or going out of business. Many of them were bailed out by the uh, Weimar Republic's government, the German state, uh, which then took equity shares in the companies it had bailed out. So it took them over. So that's the background. When Hitler comes to power in 1933, the German economy was in really, really bad shape. And it was uh, in the middle of a really severe economic crisis, which was leading to a kind of transformation of the economy and a collapse of the sort of economy that Germany had had for about 60 years before then. Now, the Nazis did have a pretty clear <coughs> economic policy and ideology. Uh, it's important to understand that the uh, Nazi party was not just about racism and anti-Semitism. That was obviously the core of their ideology, but it was not the only part. The actual name of the party, the full name, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the NSDAP, uh, tells you that economics was also an important part of their thinking, hence the use of the word socialism in their title, uh, the National Socialist Party. And the aim was to create a new kind of modernity. Uh, they wanted to create a society and an economy that was hyper-modern in many ways, but also in many ways very, very different, fundamentally different from the kind of liberal modernity that capitalist economies had created. Uh, in this, they were similar to other fascist movements elsewhere, like Mussolini's Italy, but they were much more radical, and the racism was also much, much more prominent. Now, they saw themselves as advocating an economic third way. Uh, and they deliberately counterposed their own economic policy to both Russian Bolshevism and American plutocracy. So Russian Bolshevism obviously meant Leninist communism. American plutocracy meant the kind of uh, large business dominated mass production capitalism that had grown up in the United States since the 1890s and particularly in, during the 1920s. Uh, as far as Hitler and the Nazi leadership was concerned, what united Bolshevism and plutocracy was the fact that they thought both of them were run by Jews. Uh, so that was the kind of common element as far as they were concerned. But they were opposed, therefore, not just to communism, but also to contemporary capitalism. And they saw themselves as advocating a different way of organizing economic life as well as political and social life. So they wanted, as it says here, a kind of economy that was neither classic capitalism nor socialism. It was going to be collectivist. It was going to be authoritarian. Basically, it was one where orders would determine a lot of what was done rather than market forces. It was nationalist because the nation was given priority and there was explicit ideological opposition to internationalism and to things like free trade. And it was also militarist because, firstly, the main goal of the economy was to support military power. And secondly, the whole economy was in some sense organized like an army. That was the kind of organizational model that they had in mind. So first of all, what about their policy? Well, a central element was trade policy. The central principle here was that of autarky. Uh, the Nazis aimed at making Germany as self-sufficient as possible. Uh, and therefore as dependent on foreign uh, imports and foreign supplies to the least degree you could get. They wanted to basically, they, as they put it, 
put Germany in charge of its own economic destiny. They did not want Germany to be embedded in a network of international trade relations with other parts of the world. Now, in practical terms, what this meant was that almost as soon as they came to power, they imposed very high tariffs and quotas for imports. They tried to reduce the importation of goods to as far as they possibly could. They also encouraged domestic substitutes. In other words, what did they followed the policy of what is called import substitution. Uh, instead of importing oil, for example, they encouraged the building of coal gasification plants and coal conversion plants that turned coal, which Germany had in abundance, into oil. Uh, there were other well-known uh, examples of this, uh, trying to replace during the wartime period, for example, uh, coffee with products made from acorns, for example. Uh, in other words, there was a desire to produce a whole lot of ersatz, to use the German term, products, uh, so that instead of having to import goods, you produced what were actually more expensive and less economically efficient goods at home. The point being that it's not the eco economics that matter, it's the geostrategic considerations, uh, the independence of the German state from foreign trade partners. There's also very strict regulation of trade. Uh, you need licenses to import and export. The state controls and tries, so far as it can, to actually plan the whole uh, pattern of trade. It's not left up to the choices of individual firms uh, and consumers. Now, obviously, of course, uh, Germany, because of its geographical location and size, could not become completely self-sufficient. This was simply not practical. There are all kinds of key things that no matter what they try to do, they can't produce at home. So there's a long-term goal to create a system of dependency. In other words, the idea was that there would be organized trade relations with other parts of the world, particularly with Eastern and Southeastern Europe, it was thought, by which those other parts of the world would become effectively colonies of Germany. They would supply Germany with raw materials uh, at a non-market rate, and in exchange they would be given the products of German manufacturing. So the idea was to create a kind of large economic empire uh, that would enable the German economy to control or have access to a large enough part of the planet's surface to no longer depend upon free international trade for key resources and key materials. Now, this inevitably meant almost certainly war. Uh, and this is where the economic system is intermeshed with the foreign policy and the military policy of the Third Reich. Because in many cases, the only way in the longer term that they could actually do this was by conquering large parts of Europe, in particular, large parts of the Soviet Union. Uh, because it was the Soviet Union that controlled things like oil, but also other key resources like nickel, for example. And so, therefore, this idea of creating an autarkic trade system cut off from the rest of the world was inevitably linked to the idea of planning and waging an aggressive war, ultimately, with the Soviet Union. Now, this is linked to the uh, industrial policy. Now, initially, many of the large firms that the Weimar Republic had taken into state ownership as part of their bailout program were privatized. They were sold off. So, for example, the United Steelworks, uh, I got, you got the German word there, was privatized, one of the largest industrial concerns in Germany. One of the reasons for doing this was actually to raise money, because you also have an enormous rearmament program. And this rearmament program, which begins as soon as the party comes to power, is very, very expensive. Uh, and also, for a long time, had to be kept secret. Uh, it couldn't be openly funded out of taxation or government borrowing, because to do so would violate clauses of the Versailles Treaty, which they had not yet revoked. And it would also alert the French and the British to what was going on. And they wanted to keep this secret for as long as possible. So privatizing state enterprises was a way of raising funds for rearmament without openly or overtly raising taxes or borrowing. Although they did a great deal of the borrowing, more of that in a moment. Uh, so they did indeed privatize a lot of the state owned enterprises. But at the same time, particularly later on, they also set up a whole number of state-owned enterprises. 
One of the largest was the Hermann Göring Werke, uh, which was a very large state-owned steel and heavy manufacturing uh, corporation set up in the later part of the 1930s to produce materials for rearmament, which private businesses were not prepared to undertake because it was simply not economically worthwhile for them. There was also state direction of investment and spending. Now, this was not done directly in many cases. Sometimes it was, but more often it was done by contracts. What would happen is that the state would provide very large contracts uh, to private companies. And these contracts were issued on a take it or leave it basis. The private firm could not really negotiate with the German state about what the contract was about or what the details were. They had to either simply refuse to do it, which in some cases they did, but more often not, they took it. And by this, a large part of their productive activity and their capacity was directed uh, in, in the uh, direction that the German state, the German leadership wanted it to go. So by uh, becoming the largest single purchaser by far of certain very important kinds of product and certain very large German enterprises, the state effectively through its or near monopsony power was able to effectively control large parts of the economy. So they don't uh, typically take over uh, the economy. It's not a state-owned economy. It's still an economy in which the bulk of productive assets are privately owned. But increasingly, because of outright directives in some cases, but more often this system of government contracts, those private ownerships were essentially under the control of the direction of central uh, Nazi planning. And all of the German economy's uh, uh, activity, if you like, was increasingly directed towards the goal of German rearmament and of building a particular kind of economy, the kind of autarkic economy that I mentioned a moment ago. There was a very clear focus upon large firms and heavy industry. One of the first things that the Nazi party did was to put through a edict, a law, which stated that you could not incorporate, become a private company, a limited company, unless you had an extremely large amount of capital. And so essentially, a lot of private businesses were dissolved uh, and just had to become sole traders or private partnerships, if that. Uh, you could only become a recognized company if you were a large company. There was also the deliberate encouragement of cartels, uh, of agreements or outright mergers between large firms to prevent what the Nazis saw as wasteful competition. There was also a very clear social policy. Uh, the Nazis were opposed to welfare universalism, which they saw as a system that gave assistance to the unfit in various ways. So they did not like the kind of universal welfare state being created elsewhere uh, in Europe at this time. What they did do, however, was to have still, despite that, a fairly extensive kind of welfare system, but one that tended to give out benefits on explicitly racial or national grounds. There was a very large organization set up called the NSV, which was a kind of quasi-private, quasi-public form of welfare distributing organization. It was a kind of national friendly society that people uh, made contributions to. In theory, these were voluntary. In practice, they were not. It was actually officially a branch of the Nazi party. So although it was a state agency, it was an arm's length agency controlled by the party itself rather than by the civilian government. It was one part of the way in which uh, the party sought to extend its control of German society through welfare benefits. They also got rid of all the trade unions that had existed before they came to power and replaced them with a single monopoly labor organization, the Labour Front, as well as uh, conducting supposed negotiations with uh, employers to arrive at national and universal contracts rather than local or firm-based contracts, the Labour Front also provided a wide range of welfare benefits such as holiday camps uh, and various other kinds of fringe benefits of that kind. There was a big focus, by the way, on fitness and public health. Uh, this was a major part of the uh, state's agenda at this time. There was a very distinctive agricultural and environmental policy. One of the major features of the Nazi economy was the emphasis, obviously, upon agrarian self-sufficiency. And this was linked to the idea 
that agriculture and farming and rural life was in some ways preferable to urban life, uh, more morally uplifting, if you will. And this was associated with a very aggressive environmentalist policy. Uh, the, the Nazi party was actually quite green in terms of its ideology. And this was associated with a man called Walter Darre, who was the uh, agriculture minister in the Third Reich and also one of the party's leading ideologists. Uh, finally, though, and crucially, you have an unorthodox monetary policy. As I uh, said, there was large-scale rearmament. There was also very large-scale capital investment in things like infrastructure, uh, major industrial plant and the like. Now, all of this cost a lot of money, uh, and they did not want, for various reasons, to raise taxes too much. So it was funded largely by a highly unorthodox kind of monetary policy known as MIFO bills. MIFO was the name of a purely imaginary kind of private company, uh, which was owned entirely by the German treasury and was effectively actually just a pretend organization. It was really just there as a cover uh, for the issue of what was essentially printed money. What happened was this, the German state would buy products from large German firms through the mechanism uh, that I described of coercive contracts. They would pay them, not in Reichsmarks, actual currency, but in promissory notes issued by this imaginary company, MIFO. The promissory notes would say that the bearer would be paid in Reichsmarks after a certain number of years, but there was an option to extend it. Now these notes would be then given to the company that had produce the steel or whatever it was that the German state was buying. The company could then in turn use these MIFO notes uh, to pay for other bills because people would accept it because it was backed by the ultimate promise of the German state uh, to redeem it in currency. It was therefore essentially a form of highly liquid sovereign debt. Now what the Germans did was to issue enormous amounts of these MIFO bills in terms of their monetary value. But what they also did was to keep on extending it. Now, therefore, initially the term would be two years, but that was then extended to five years, and then it was extended yet again. Now, there was a good reason for this, which was that initially this money printing exercise led to great success. It enabled the German government to mobilize a lot of idle resources. But what it meant, of course, was that as those resources ceased to be idle, there were increasingly severe problems. All of these promissory notes had to be paid. If they were going to be paid in Reichsmarks, actual currency, that would almost inevitably lead to inflation, which the Germans wanted to avoid at almost any cost because of their recent historical experience. So the Nazi government, by the end of the 1930s, was facing very, very severe problems. It was also facing an increasingly severe problem in terms of its balance of payments and in terms of financing imports because its economic strategy had resulted, amongst other things, in a decline in export earnings. And what this meant was that it was finding it increasingly difficult to fund payment for its imports which were still quite large. And obviously, of course, foreign firms would not accept MIFO bills in payment because uh, they wanted to be paid in whatever their own currency was. So by the end of the 1930s, this monetary policy was increasingly uh, facing a crisis, but it had worked quite well up to then. So what were the results? Well, here you can see the main results. There was a very rapid and sustained fall in unemployment. The armament boom created a huge amount of work in the major heavy industrial sectors in Germany. And this soaked up all the unemployment that had appeared in the latter stages of the Weimar Republic. The consumer economy recovered less well. Generally speaking, German consumers were held down and their spending was held down by a combination of taxes, uh, higher prices, but more particularly the effects of the trade policy of the German state. Now, initially, though, overall, it looked as though this policy was highly successful. But by 1936, as I said a moment ago, it was facing increasingly severe problems. Uh, there were severe foreign exchange problems. 
the national debt in reality had reached a point where it was no longer sustainable. And also the German economy was now working at pretty close to full capacity, but it couldn't expand its capacity because there was not enough actual money around to now invest further uh, in productive activity. Now you can see this, a couple of graphs. This is GNP. Uh, the orange line is gross national income. You can see that there's the dip in 1932. You'll see it was actually beginning to recover at the time that the Nazis came to power in 33. But then there's a steady growth. Uh, that's a bit misleading though. That again shows you the problems with these linear graphs. If you look at the bar charts, these measure the change on the previous year. And you'll see that in 1936, uh, there's actually a bit of a slowdown in the economy. Uh, that's the crisis I mentioned. There's then a boost after that, before there's a further crisis, immediately before the outbreak of the war. This is German unemployment, and that just illustrates the point I made at the start. You can see here the enormous spike in unemployment between 1929 and 1933, with the peak there in 1933. Uh, and then you can see the very sharp decline in unemployment right down to the outbreak of the war. Now, what happens is that in 1936, faced with this crisis, uh, the Nazi party and the Nazi leadership become much more radical. In 1936, they'd actually draw up a four-year plan with Hermann Goering put in charge of it. Uh, in other words, they moved towards much more overt state direction of the economy. Uh, the German firms are given much less ability to simply refuse to do what they are told. And there's a much more explicit set of state targets and state direction of the economy put in place. This whole plan was very clearly and explicitly war oriented. Something that's probably already always been there now becomes much more obvious. The severe economic difficulties that Nazi Germany was facing from 1936 onwards are almost certainly related to its more reckless foreign policy. This is the point at which Hitler's foreign policy also becomes much, much more aggressive. And it's quite likely, and has been argued by a number of historians, that the reason for this was that he was aware <coughs> that time was running out for him economically, and that he had to basically do uh, what he had to do as quickly as possible. Now, as it says already, there's a clear connection between the economic philosophy of the party and war. There's also a connection with the way the war was fought, the plundering of foreign countries and the geostrategic goals. It's the economic philosophy and plan that explains why they attacked the Soviet Union, rather than any kind of um, explicit ideological conflict. What you find during the war is two new developments in the economic strategy. <clears throat> the first is the systematic looting of occupied countries in order basically to keep up German consumption levels rather than forcing them down. The other is the systematic and extensive use of slave labor with virtually all of the large firms in Germany using extremely large numbers of slave laborers, Jews, Poles, Russians, gypsies, many, many other people. By the time you get to 1944, some of the German firms like Krupp have as many as 25% of their workers, slave workers. So this is a key central part of the economy as it develops during the war. So here is the assessment. This is not socialism as the term is commonly understood, but it's also clearly not a free market capitalist economy. It's a kind of state-directed economy through what you might call very heavy nudging before 1936, but much more explicit state control after 1936, and particularly during the war. It's oriented towards non-economic ends. The goal of the economy is not to promote private welfare or consumption, is to promote military power and national power and independence. It's radicalized during World War II. How do we understand that? Well, as it says here, what you find during World War II is that the underlying logic of the economy is worked out under the pressure of events. So during World War II, the economy develops in the direction that it was already implicitly going in, but it does so much more rapidly. 
Initially, in the 1930s, between 33 and 36, or 37 perhaps, it seems to be working very well. <coughs> There's actually a lot of interest elsewhere, uh, including the United States. Many other countries think that Hitler's Germany with the Autobahns, the Volkswagen, and things like this, is a model that they might be interested in following. Towards the end of the decade, uh, not only does Hitler's foreign policy put a lot of people off it, but also increasingly they can see the problems that the German economy is facing. And in fact, by the 1930s, as Adam Tooze, for example, has shown in his brilliant book, The Wages of Destruction, it had become really a disaster. Had the war not happened, there would have been a pretty serious economic crisis uh, caused by, for example, all of those MIFO bills, either becoming worthless, people not prepared to accept them, or falling due and resulting in serious inflation. The policy that they had been following simply could not continue. And had they not had war, this would have become very, very obvious by probably 1940 or 1941. The key figures are, features rather, are nationalism and a militarist style of collectivism. So this is basically a nationalist form of political economy of a very extreme kind. Later on, overt slave labor becomes a central or important feature of the economy. You don't get that before the war, but it becomes a very important feature of the economy as it developed during the wartime years. So what you have here is a quite different kind of political and economic system. It's not just about racism, there's a clear kind of economic system which derives from the racial and nationalist politics of the regime. 